<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and I am your host of Classical Revolution here on IDAGIO. This weekly series, um, I'm meeting with guests who really inspire me, um, trailblazers and real visionaries in the classical music world. And I'm sitting down with them, and I'm asking them what goes behind their approach what fuels their, their creativity and also their ability to break rules and really push boundaries in this genre. I'm thrilled to be joined by today's guest. She is a soprano and a composer. She's been hailed by the Times as the modern day Kathy Barbarian or Meredith Monk. She's performed at prestigious venues like the Royal Albert Hall, Wakemore Hall uh, with the BBC proms. And she's performing opera, contemporary music. She performs her own compositions. And she also uh, writes a lot of commissions as well. She is co-director of a, a very interesting contemporary quartet comprised of a, a sort of unique selection of instruments, a harp, soprano, clarinet, and double bass. Um, and they've received a lot of praise and this this month, on July 25th, they'll release their first album on Delphian Records. So make sure you check that out. Uh, in addition to this, she's also in a five-person folk band, a founding, she's a founding member, uh, also a founding member of an a cappella vocal ensemble, both of uh, which, with which she has um, recorded several albums. And as a fun side note, during Corona, she's been doing this very cool Corona Solfege Challenge where she's performing um, Solfege. I can't actually, I can't even really explain it. It's really cool and um, I wouldn't be able to explain it properly. So just check out her Instagram and, and uh, see um, how creative you can be doing Solfege. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, uh, please welcome Eloise Werner. Hi, Eloise. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being here. It's it's really, really nice. Um, I like to begin the show by asking my guests what their first introductions to music were and um, whether there was a specific moment that sort of sparked what is now your lifelong passion for music. Yes. Um... I think, so when I was young, I was part of a choir. Um, so I was raised in Paris and uh, only moved to the UK when I was 18. So in fact, all my childhood was in Paris and I was a member of the French radio children's choir. And so I joined that when I was about 12. And a few years before, I went to see a concert of them performing this sort of uh, children's opera. Um, and I was completely blown away. And I thought, this is what I want to do. This is, I want to join this choir. And um, yes, and then I did, and then kind of transformed my life from then really. Oh, wow. Okay. So the entry point was, was, was choir. And was there, like, do you remember there ever was it a, a moment or was it a kind of compilation of moments for you yes. that led you really, because think, you're all composing? Yes, I think it was, um, it was sort of, it was not like, it was between, I guess, a musical and an opera. So um, it's this French composer called Julien Joubert, um, who writes really amazing, beautiful, nostalgic uh, music. And especially for children, it's, uh, with kind of children's voices that sing that music is very moving and I remember a lot of the songs and the kind of um when lots of voices sing together at the same time with different voices and like harmony and um I loved it and I thought this is this is brilliant this is what I want to do but I was already playing the cello before actually um so it wasn't my first introduction introduction to music I guess but um it was I think that moment when I thought wow this is this is really what I want to do. And also singing at, the, at that time, this is what I, I want to start singing more. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, I didn't realize that you were a cellist as well. So I should have included that in my intro, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so do you play, sometimes do you play cello in your, in your quartet as well? So I don't play, I play cello in my folk band. Um, okay. 
but I play with the Hermes experiment, which is the contemporary quartet with the double bass and the clarinet and the harp. I only yeah. sing in that, so I don't play cello. But okay. I do uh, sometimes play cello and sing um, okay. sort of pieces that I write. So, for instance, the opera I wrote two years ago and I performed again last year has cello in it as well. Um, so oh, sort of and then you really to accompany myself while singing. Oh, wow. OK. Oh, that's amazing. I, I didn't realize that. So that's just <laughs> even cooler. <laughs> um, Eloise, you've like you've created such a singular path for yourself. It seems it's so unique. Um, it's and especially in the classical genre, it's really um, it's really special. And I'm so curious where that began, especially, you know, post, maybe even post-education where that, or, or during education, but where that really began, where you started to sort of see all of, I imagine, see all the different things come together or? Mm, I think I've, I've always um, loved diff lo lots of different things within music. So even though I joined this choir um, and it was very special because essentially we had school in the morning and then choir every afternoon. So it was like a massive commitment almost like a sort of music school, but with all the school in the morning and normal normal school um, and did sort of science and the sort of standard French curriculum. But um, so yeah, we had lots of kind of, it was very open in terms of the education we had, um, but I still did cello on the side and at the conservatoire. And I, since quite a young age, I wrote music as well. And I wrote music for the choir and I wrote songs me to sort of sing at the piano and so music for me has always been something that I I didn't think I was going to be one particular thing um, and even at the beginning I guess cello was my first instrument and I practiced a lot when I was a teenager and I you know I got quite good but I, I never really thought I just want to be a cellist um, mm -hmm. and so then I suppose that's why I moved abroad um, because in France you sort of it's quite difficult to actually not do just the one thing in music yeah. you know, they sort of say you have to go to a conservatoire and study this thing um whereas i wanted to have a more kind of well i didn't want to give up uh, parts of what i was doing so i looked at universities abroad and then uh the uk has uh music courses at universities where you can sort of combine academic um work with practical and uh, composition and choir and singing and chairman music so um, that's what I did um, to kind of postpone the moment where I had to or I thought I'd had to choose what I was going to do and then finish that and then move to London and sort of kept doing that <laughs> um, yeah. it's now a lot more narrow because I'm actually just sort of focusing on singing and composition a bit of cello as well but I'm still managing to do both and um yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to change it really. And just, yeah. just focusing on being an opera singer or just focusing on just writing music for other people and not performing at all. Because I think I would find that difficult. And it, it's a very difficult career path anyway. Um, so I enjoy the variety and sort of being able to go between different things. Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's the ultimate um the ultimate way to experience to to be a classical musician because it's such a rich art form that um, the chance to get to explore it in so many different ways is actually a really great thing it's just that it's not so common right but mm. um, no it's amazing um so i'm also a multi-instrumentalist and so I, I i had this thought to ask you because my my path ha has of course it's it's been very different but you know, along the way, there was a lot of adversity for me where I would meet people and they would say, you know, you really can't be a singer and a pianist and you have to decide and especially really becoming um, professional. And I was wondering if you have encountered that or like what kind of um, adversity have you experienced or have you experienced any? And if so, like, how have you um, dealt with that yourself? Yes, I think I definitely have experienced that. Um... But at the same time, it was funny because I think what I experienced is that sometimes, um, you know, what like you do auditions, for instance, I find those very frustrating because there's, there's so many people going for the same audition for the same role. And at the end of the day, there's just one singer who's going to get it. And it's, it's and the likelihood is that you're not going to get that part. And you go out feeling really 
sad and everything's going badly. So every time I try to be like, okay, I'm going to try and focus on doing that. It doesn't really work. And every time I go back to sort of being more open and actually collaborating with who I want to collaborate and work with who I want to work, I'm way more happy and it works better. So although the industry has sort of keep, kept telling me, no, you should just probably just focus on one thing. Every time I tried to do that, it didn't seem to work for me. I sort of like hit oh. a wall a little bit. Um, so actually very quickly, I just realized, well, that's not what I'm going to do. And even though people say, perhaps a few people say, you know, you should perhaps think about just doing that. I just didn't because I just, it didn't work for me. But actually also more and more I found that, and perhaps more in recent years, um, people actually in within the industry as well seem to uh, value the fact that I do different things and perhaps I'm more interested in working with me on projects because I've got this uh, network of people around me and I've worked in different sort of genres and different people. Um, and so perhaps if they want to do an interesting project that I, I'll have more, um, well, I've, I'll have done different things. And so, um, so actually it's led to lots of interesting stuff. And definitely I, I don't think I would encourage anyone to just do the same because there's no reason why you should force yourself to go through a tunnel. And then this, all the tunnels are so narrow that you, it can work, but the likelihood is that it will get quite frustrating and competitive. And if you try and just sort of yeah, audition for things or try and fit the model that the industry wants you to fit, then there's going to be too many people. And ultimately what I want to do is just do what I want to do. So <laughs> just be what, do what I can offer with my background and my skills and what I enjoy doing. Otherwise, yeah. that's the point. Um, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's watching you do what you do. It's so, so clear that that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just so clear that it's, um, it's a whole all encompassing thing. Mm. Um, it's, it's really amazing to see. Um, I'm, I'm, I've read some, some cool uh, interviews of yours and there's one in which you're talking about, I'm, I want to talk to you a little bit about your compositional process or even your, your thoughts about music and in one interview, you're talking, you're speaking about sound and how and how this can express certain uh, emotions that we can't necessarily express with words. And you talk about sort of the the properties, the emotional properties of sound. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Mm, yes. Um, so I guess that was probably related to the one woman opera that I wrote, uh, which is called The Other Side of the Sea. And the idea with the opera is that um, it, it sort of explores the relationship between language and performance and language and identity. Uh, being a, a French native speaker, living in a, a different country, having learned English quite late and being a performer and feeling like when I speak English, I'm performing all the time and sometimes not being really able to express what I really mean uh, via words. Um, so basically, I wrote this opera, um, which sort of combines language, but also obviously music and just sounds. Um, and throughout the piece, what happens is that I sort of create this new language through a series of abstract sounds. Um, and by the end of the piece, I perform this whole thing, which is just, just mostly all the words have been gradually replaced by sounds. And I express all this sort of stuff with um, I express the fact that I can't express myself in English via yeah. sounds. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's what I really love about um, singing and also writing um, for myself to perform and especially to sing. I also love writing for other performers, but when I write for myself, I'm really interested in the way I can use my voice uh, to express sort of emotions and ideas really directly, not necessarily using words, but using sort of sounds and all the amazing things that you can do with the voice, not necessarily just beautiful singing, which I love listening to and I love trying to do as well, but um, also everything in between and the sort of sounds that we make um, every day um, and how I can try and reproduce that into my compositions. Um, and that's why it's really fun when I can write for myself because I basically use my body to create my yeah. music. So there's like a very direct, immediate connection, which is um, quite interesting. And 
I think the sort of stuff I write for myself to perform, I don't necessarily need to write it beautifully on, a, on Sibelius and notate it very well on a score. You know, it's sort of, I can scribble bits on a bit of paper and then it's in my head. So it's a kind of different process, compositional process from when I write for maybe another singer where I have to send them the score and, and um, although obviously there's some similarities, but yeah, I, I just really like using my body and also the physicality of it and the theatricality is really important to me and I love acting and I love um I love watching plays is like one of my mm -hmm. favorite things is like theater yeah. and um I found and I love myself trying to yeah act is something that I've always loved to do and this idea of using the voice as the main way to kind of con convey emotions and and also the body language and it's all kind of very theatrical um so I really like that that's so interesting. And do you feel like that has become more that you talk about the directness of it, which I can only just imagine. Um, and especially even even more so dealing with like really abstract sound and then the directness of that. It, it That's so fascinating. And has that do you feel like it's developed a lot like over the years that you've been composing? Um, and how do how do you feel that's developed? Has it become more easier to access that or? Yes, I think so. And I think also I've, the more I perform and the more I write, the more I'm able to sort of control those. Um, right. I think when you sort of start uh, doing that stuff, it's quite easy to quite go a bit, be a bit too much, you know, just a bit like that. Um, oh. And it's quite annoying, <laughs> both for the audience and the performer. Um, and I think, yeah, sort of developing the idea of I can use those emotions and, and sounds, but in the right way, not too little, not too much, and sort of finding the right balance and the kind of pacing, like in, in for instance, in the, sh the one woman opera I wrote, um, I actually last year I performed it again and I revised it a bit and sort of changed the pacing of it and sort of, yeah, um, so that perhaps some bits were slower and some bits were sort of more condensed mm -hmm. and and perhaps some bits weren't so intense or some were more intense you know and, but the more you do it I guess the more you uh you feel what's what feels right um yeah and also I guess my voice has also developed in the last right. um, six years or so um and so the voice develops and so you have to adapt and the body changes and uh, that also kind of I guess consciously or not informs what I'm going to write for myself to to perform for sure that's it's so interesting um it's like it's in a way it's for you it could be a lifelong process because we're always changing and even your emotions and your relationship with your body is always changing and so that's that's very cool um I'd love to talk to you about your your uh, ensemble, the Hermes Project, uh, Hermes Experiment, right? Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about it. I, what I find fascinating is that it's comprised of this very unusual set of players, as I mentioned in the introduction. Um, and I, I'm wondering, is that yeah, what what brought that combination together? Because what's really cool about it is that um, you end up having to commission a lot of work. I I'm assuming, and also. I see that you do a lot of improvising. So yeah, tell us a little bit about the Hermes experiment. Yes. So as you mentioned, so it's four uh, performers. Um, so there's a double bass, a harp, a clarinet, and myself singing. And the idea with the ensemble is that as far as we know, no one has ever tried this combination of instruments um, ever before. So there was no existing repertoire when we formed. And the idea is that we had to commission composers and write, um, sorry, and collaborate with composers closely to create this repertoire and also perhaps um, arrange some existing works for a combination or improvise slash perhaps devise our own material as well. Um, so over the past six years or so, that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. And um, the great kind of, well, the concept of it is that the, our repertoire grows as we evolve as an ensemble. So that when once we have a commission, then uh, we'll keep performing it because it's just not like a new piece that we commission and then it sort of gets forgotten. It actually becomes part of what other 
the music that we perform as an ensemble. So for composers, it's really great because they get more than one performance. So often as a composer, you get a premiere, perhaps a repeat performance, um, but then often, you know, until the next sort of ensembles contacts you and be like, can I perform your piece? It can be quite a while. Um, but once we have a piece, then we will keep performing it again and again in our concert. So, so far we've commissioned over 50 composers um, and we keep commissioning still uh, new works. At the beginning, when we formed, we obviously needed to commission composers very frequently because we have no repertoire. Now, um, I suppose um, we commission perhaps a bit less frequently, but uh, because also we are more established and we get more funding, we're able to commission perhaps composers that are more established and that, so that needs uh, more money. So we can't do it so regularly. But anyway, we also um, commission like uh, young composers, more established ones, everything in between. So um, different styles and we really, uh, kind of keen to work with um, yeah lots of different um, composers from different backgrounds who bring all their way of working so it's been really interesting for us um, and yeah we've got our debut album coming out this month and on there um, it's basically um, nine of our commissions from uh, the past uh, six years uh, we've got so again uh, because of um, it's quite varied um, because of the nature of the composers. So hopefully there's something for everyone on there. And what's been really nice is that all, most of the commissions that we've recorded on that album, we'd performed already quite a lot over the last couple of years. So we got to a place in the recording studio where we knew them so well, having actually had the opportunity to perform the works in front of audiences a few times, which is not always the case when you do a recording. So that was, uh, yeah, that was really great. Um, yes, and I guess often people think, you know, double bass, harp, clarinet, voice, what, what is that about? I mean, that sounds weird. And it, I guess it is a bit weird, but actually it does work. And people are always surprised that it, the combination of sounds is really interesting because um, I suppose in a way it's almost a little bit like a jazz setting. You've got the sort of bass, you've got the harp, which is sort of like the harmony instrument, yeah. and the, vo the voice and the clarinet sort of match each other uh, but obviously there's way more than that as well and we're just we're oh, yeah. keep discovering sort of different combinations within the group and the way the instruments work together and for me as a singer um it's really nice because the idea with it is that it's not just a singer and an ensemble it's very much four individuals who have the same kind of input artistically and I hate this idea that the singer is at the front and that like accompanied by a backing, you know. Band. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, sometimes I know that works like that, but with Hermes, that's really not the kind of idea. And even though most of the pieces have voice in it, all the instruments have got such a important part in the in the piece and often very theatrical part as well. <laughs> so everyone's kind of carries the narrative, um, not just the singer, which is something that I, yeah, that's really, really nice. And I'm really lucky to be able to do chamber music at that level with amazing instrumentalists. Because as a singer, again, it's not something that you necessarily have the opportunity to do so much with sort of three other instrumentalists. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. And, and on that, also on that level, or like you talked about that volume of also contemporary, uh, of new music as well. It's not, it's, it's quite rare. So it, that's fantastic. Um, I, I'm also curious what your folk side of your musical life, what that brings, how the two complement each other, and how does what what do you get from folk music? Do you feel in your folk band that maybe you don't get from classical music, and vice versa? What's that? What's that like? Yes, I think um, one of the things I love, whether it's in folk or in contemporary or the sort of music I write, is rhythm. I'm kind of very, and in the Corona self edge I do, it's kind of like rhythmic based. Um, and I get really excited by rhythm and complex rhythm and having a really good groove um, and kind of having the pulse really stable. And that's what I love about the folk band or in Hermes, we all very rhythmic, rhythmically really tied together um, and we kind of feel the music in the same way. So there's never kind of 
yeah, we never have to discuss that. It's it's really sort of, and that's really important for me to work with people who kind of feel with them in the same way. And in the Fogue brand, what's really fun, I guess, is obviously um, most of the time we don't use uh, music in a concert. Um, and, you know, that's, I guess it's sort of like, of course, in classical music, you don't always use music at, at um, kind of scores and music either, but the kind of band idea can be also quite liberating in terms of not having a stand and the music stand and it's more just about the feel of it and even the even if the musical level is really high and the rhythm and tuning is also also super detailed but I guess there's it's more about um yeah there's in a way like the focus is really the music and there's nothing in between to kind of uh makes you a bit paranoid that oh I'm gonna do that wrong um, and it's really fun and it's really baiting and in the stuff that we do with the folk band yeah it's like rhythm is really important and and me on the cello I sort of provide sort of a rhythmic the rhythm quite a lot um mm. which is something I really really enjoy doing um but also in terms of the singing style I mean that's something that I've um sometimes found a bit difficult because Obviously, if you sing, because, uh, yeah, in the folk band, we all sing, so we all take turns, but I do also sing quite a few of the songs. And obviously, you don't sing in the same way if you sing a folk tune than if you sing uh, more kind of operatic or contemporary work. Um, and in, if you sing uh, in the folk band, most likely you might use a microphone. If you sing uh, in classical setting, there wouldn't be a microphone, and it, you wouldn't sing in the same way in a microphone than in not a microphone. Um, so sometimes that's a bit uh, interesting to, I mean, I really like it, but sometimes it's a bit stressful to be like, oh, I can't actually like sing full on in the microphone because it's just going to go mental. Um, and, um, but then it, it just makes you sort of, yeah, it's, it's different approach and I enjoy exploring different mm -hmm. styles of singing. Um, yeah. and also seeing kind of, you know, folk concerts or, or bands versus a, a contemporary music concert or, or classical music concert. Um, I really, I, I like that in a kind of perhaps not classical concert, the vibe generally is a bit more chilled out and perhaps the performer always talks to the audience or often sort of makes a few jokes. And, um, and sometimes in the yeah. classical music concerts, it's also the case, but sometimes it can be a bit sort of conservative and, and sort of a bit stressful. Uh, which can be good in some ways but also so I, I like kind of exploring different see what's you know what's happening and then finding what I like and and sort of mixing it all up in in the way that I do but in Hermes for instance we always um talk to the audience and one of our big things is that we sort of almost like spoken program notes especially as some of the works that we do are perhaps a bit challenging at first because they are contemporary so a bit atonal and a bit wacky and weird um it's really important i think to give the audience a chance to sort of guide them through it a little bit um explaining kind of the origin of the work and the, what the words mean and perhaps explaining some of the techniques that we use etc so they can really connect with uh, the work and that's something that i think audiences always enjoy um uh, so that's yeah. that, that's really interesting. So you're giving them an, an a real entry point into it, especially with contemporary music. It's so important because um, there's we don't always have the context. You know, we we have the luxury of having the context of Mozart or Beethoven, but um, with with contemporary music, that can sometimes be really hard for an audience. I, I also going back on what you said, I, I find that really interesting about how your folk your folk world and your folk the folk side of you how how it doesn't just um, interplay between your voice and between like musically um, but also just that experience as a performer and how they really lend that's just that's so interesting I've never thought about that before um, and yeah I mean yeah then it, then it of course then it brings out the subject of like I mean how how do you feel about it? or is it necessary to be so conservative uh, in the classical world as as musicians? You know, when we're doing a song recital or what have you, how do you feel about that? Yes, I think, I mean, it's a tricky question and I guess it depends um, on the context. And I wouldn't say that I don't enjoy going to a fairly traditional song recital, uh, seeing amazing performers deliver like beautiful, you know, song cycle by Schubert or Schumann. And, you know, they can be wearing like beautiful 
I don't know, like quite conservative clothes and not move and there's the yeah. piano, but but they can still deliver amazingly the text and the way that both the pianist and the singer collaborate, like work together. Yeah. And it can be really, really powerful. Um, but also, yeah, I've been thinking uh, quite a lot about uh, actually, yeah, art song and, and how it's presented because sometimes I do also get a bit frustrated um, by it in some instances and I've done a couple of master classes where you know they tell you yeah you can't move you have to be so still and it, it's all about um, the focus should be on the words and which is true but also you know it's kind of quite conservative that it's just like it needs to be like that um, you can't really move around um, and so actually last year I wrote a uh, a new piece for piano and soprano, which I performed with Natalie Birch, she's an amazing okay. pianist, and um, performed it alongside Britain Les Illuminations oh, for nice. uh, the piano version. The piano version. So, yeah, and also a new commission by another composer, Jonathan Woolgar, who I commissioned. So there were two new commissions, both sort of responding to the Britain. And the idea with the commissions, and especially my piece, that is actually how to explore how theatrical can you be still in a song recital and how mm-hmm. um how can you push the boundaries further and is it possible to escape the sort of stressy song recital vibe and feel because i i it also came from me as a performer always finding quite uncomfortable in that situation as a performer and perhaps i'm just not very good at it but i just yeah i i, oh, I, just, I don't piano, think you're alone in that <laughs> and uh, sort of, I, no. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, the pianist being kind of quite hidden, you can't really see them, and the singer still being sort of more in front. Um, and there's something, like, in the relationship and um, and how there's to involve... There's something unnatural about it. it. I mean, <laughs> I'm speaking as someone who accompanies myself on the piano, but it because it always felt very unnatural to just be in front of the piano. But, I mean, that's another story, but yeah. I completely understand. And then, of course, there's the question of the audience, because... Um, I don't know. How, I know so many people who go to these recitals and they are also feel constricted. They can feel those constrictions because, of course, they can feel what what we're feeling as well. Yeah. And, um, and so in the piece I wrote is a 10 minute uh, piece and it's a setting of Rambo's poetry as well, which um, was also the yeah. Britain is setting of, so it's a setting of some other bits of um, Rambo's work. and. I made Natalie sing as well and, and speak okay. and she has to sing a top A flat. <laughs> I did really? talk with her before and she's like, yeah, she'll bring it on. Um, yeah, so, and, and actually audiences really enjoyed it. And actually the song starts with, it's Natalie who starts doing any kind of, she's the first one to speak. Um, oh, and so true. people were like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> um, and yeah, I, and I really enjoy exploring that. Also the use of the voices, the voice, um, by other performers, whether they are playing the piano or even I wrote a piece for a friend of mine who's a violinist and I made her sing as well while playing. Um, I've got a new commission next year for a string quartet and I'm all going to make them sing as well or use their yeah. voices in some ways. Um, yeah. yeah, not necessarily sing, but kind of use their voices because if you play the piano or the cello or yeah string instrument I mean with the violin it can be more tricky but as long as you have basically your mouth and your face available you are able to kind of make some noises um Mm -hmm. I'm quite interested in in that Um, well and it just breaks the rules as well a little bit you know yeah never a bad thing Mm-hmm. That's uh, very, very interesting. Um, well, we're almost out of time, and I definitely want to make sure that I ask you the question that I always close with, um, hence, the, hence the title of the series, Classical Revolution. Um, how, how do you feel music can be revolutionary, or when have you experienced music? to be revolutionary or do you feel that it's like it's just one of those questions where you can say anything so <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's really tricky I mean I feel like and perhaps it's um as I said earlier I'm, I'm really attracted to theatrical works and theater um and I love watching plays and often I find I go into a play and almost every time like especially a new play I'm completely mesmerized like it's it's I'm like this is amazing I've never seen anything like it you know and I think in theater it's so it's, it's, yeah forward thinking and like 
the, the, the stuff I see makes me think so much for so long. And with concert, with classical music concerts, that happens way less often. I sometimes go to a concert and it's, it's nice, but often I'm, it feels like it doesn't, it doesn't challenge me so much. Um, uh, whether it's, yeah, kind of thinking about social issues or like political issues. And of course, perhaps it's because like, if you watch a play, of course they can use words and that you can make a statement more easily with, I don't know, what, using words. But there's also something about music, which I think can have such a powerful kind of political and, and social message, which um, obviously has been done in the past so much. But in classical music at the moment, I, I, I find sometimes going to something and it's nice, but it doesn't really challenge me in that way. And I would love for it to challenge me more. Um, and I, I, I guess the times where it does, it tends to be perhaps because there's a more theatrical aspect to it. Um, um, there's a, a British uh, composer called Phil Venables who writes uh, yeah. really amazing sort of um, music theatre, really. So he writes operas, but they're, they're not just traditional operas. They really kind of blend theatre and, and music in a kind of very linked and visceral way. Um, and I've seen both of his uh, recent operas and every time that makes me think so much and I get so moved and it's so visceral. Um, and it's not just because there are words, of course, that's part of it, but it's also the music is so integral to those kind of stories that he's telling. Um, and I guess in the work I do, that's sort of what I try to do when, when I said, you know, like using sound um, in a very direct way to kind of move people and, and make people think and have an impact. Um, I performed, um, the first solo show I performed was written by another composer, but we, Jonathan Wolgau again, but we worked quite very closely on it. Um, and it was about grief and sort of how to make people talk about death more openly. And, and the use of the music was, was very much like, yeah, very visceral and very direct. And, um, and for me, yeah, that's really important that there, there's this sort of um, quite strong message uh, underlying the kind of musical material. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, I don't know if, if, again, while, you know, doing programming song recitals, for instance, I'm sure there's, there's so many ways you can be inventive with it and kind of, um, or linking it with some talks or other things that sort of make the music part of a more kind of um, bigger political or social discourse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I wonder if, if perhaps, yeah, sort of linking it to other art forms might make that transition um, easier for someone who's not musical at all and might not be able to sort of access the sort of music in the way that someone who's musical might be able to experience it. Um, so yeah, or without, or without, as we see so much now, without musical education. I mean, because that's that's just becoming like more rare, not and and simply just because of the schools. But so um, no, that's very interesting, and also it's interesting to think that. I like what you said about grief because that's also, you know, that's also revolutionary. The fact that sound can em embody grief is, I mean, that that could change someone's life, you know. So it's, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess also thinking about what's happening now and what what's going to happen next, you know, it's sort of no one really knows. But um, yeah, there's a sense that things need to change somehow. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen, and we don't know, but. Um, I'm still hopeful that it will, I mean, we need music. Um, we always have had music and we won't lose it, but it's sort of how to, how to use it for, yeah, for everyone's sort of mental well-being and, and to kind of move mm -hmm. forward with this stuff. Um, it's, yeah, something that we need to think about. Yeah, and we're given the time right now to reflect on that, which is, which is actually a good thing. Mm. Um, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you, Eloise. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, and I just wanted to say to everyone watching, make sure that you check out Eloise's playlist because she's got some amazing um, composers on there from Caroline Shaw to Meredith Monk and Bach and Schumann. And it's, it's, really, it's really wonderful. So definitely make sure you check that out. Um, Eloise, thank you so much for coming and being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um... Have a great rest of the evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.